My name is Mikko Hyppönen and this is DF Secure Labs data security wrap up for the year 2010. In this video we're going to talk about what happened in the mobile security space during the first four months of the year 2010. And to join me to discuss this we have our security advisor Sean Sullivan. So what's happened in the mobile security space? Lots of stuff so far from the end of the uh, year 2009 till now. Mm -hmm. um, practically every platform has had something interesting. That's correct. So we had stuff happening on iPhone, we had stuff on Symbian-based smartphones, on Android. Palm. There you go. Um, I suppose one of the more interesting cases we see very early in the year was this Symbian malware, which we call Merogo. And this was a SMS worm, which means it spreads further to other computers, or from, from, from one smartphone to other smartphones, using a text message. Yeah, kind of like an email worm on a PC. Very true. And of course, you can't really attach stuff to a message, but you can have a link. And that's the way these SMS worms work. So you receive a text message from someone you know, someone you trust, and there's some sort of message, and there's a link. Thanks so to a web server. And once you hit the web server, there's going to be a file which wants to install itself. And I suppose the point here is that people trust messages coming from someone they, they know. So they're going to click on the link, assuming that it, it's their friend who sent the message. And we've seen this kind of thing before, and it's in China. That's right. And this is only being reported in there. Right. But China has had a big SMS spam problem over the years, so that's probably why we see it there, but not elsewhere. Yes, it's probably a much bigger problem in general in China. And also, this was a signed application. Which is not the first time we've seen that, but it's... You know, Symbian does its job and revokes these certificates as soon as the shell company is discovered. Um, unfortunately, phones don't come by default to check mm -hmm. the security certificate of, uh, of, the, of the installed file because it might incur data charges. But in, basically, this means that you know, if you have the certification check enabled and you today try to download and run this application, the oh, certificate check would tell you that you know it's revoked. You can't run it. Right. Then on the Windows mobile side, we have the, um, the 3D anti-terrorist Trojan. Mm -hmm. It's a game, um, fully functional game, I believe, as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of our analysts in Kuala Lumpur tried it out, actually extensively tested the game. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, how often did it try to dial out? It was, it was actually, the way it worked is that once you got infected by this game, once you installed this game, mm -hmm. um, it would have a random timer, timer of a couple of hours into the future, uh, for example, within six hours of, of installing the application, it would start making these phone calls out from your device. Right. It would try dialing nine numbers, and then it would sleep for a month. And I suppose the logic here is that, you know, then these charges that end up on your phone bill, and of course the money goes to the criminals, you know, happen only once a month. And if people have monthly billing, they're not going to notice this. It was a premium rate number. Yes. Right. We've seen something similar to this a few years ago. So Although something. we've never before seen stuff that actually makes phone calls. We've seen mm -hmm. stuff that sends text messages to expensive numbers. This mm -hmm. was actually using real calls. So we would call for a minute or two, and the numbers were all in faraway countries, including Antarctica was one of the area codes it was using. And this is on Windows Mobile. This is Windows Mobile, and, and Windows Mobile, uh, the, the older generation, of course, the newly announced Windows Mobile 7 isn't out yet, and it's not affected by this. Mm -hmm which actually affect the platform market as we see things going through 2010. Sure. Um, then what do we, iPad, yeah. uh, iPhone, OS 4, mm -hmm. um, expanding the base of the iPhone OS. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does it actually mean that we have, we're going to have multitasking on iPhone and of course on iPad? What does it mean from security point of view? I'd expect less jailbreaking, mm -hmm. which the one uh, version of a worm attack that we've seen for iPhone has been on jailbroken phones. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main reasons people want to jailbreak is so they can have multitasking apps. Right. If OS 4 uh, provides multitasking to, to begin with without jailbreaking, mm -hmm. fewer jailbreakers, less opportunity to get in through that right. vulnerability. So basically from security point of view, um, iPhone OS 4 is good news. Yeah, it gives the customer base what uh, they've been asking for and Apple keeps them within the walled garden. Mm -hmm. Another interesting point from, from the iPhone security, I think, although we haven't seen any real malware yet for iPhone devices which have not been jailbroken, if you just look at the security vulnerabilities, I mean, the, the last set of patches from Apple for iPhone had four remote code execution vulnerabilities on the device. Two of them in the browser, one in the music player, and one in the image viewing application. And I mean, I mean these are exactly the kind of remote holes that could be used to write Worms, worms which would infect your phone, I mean, hands-free. You could right. be sleeping and you would get infected. Look up the 
contact list and send it to all your contacts? And a worm like that would go around the world in minutes, and then this is the nightmare scenario, but it hasn't happened. Yep. And here's the spreadsheet the guys in the lab put together mm -hmm. from June 2008 all the way till the last set of patches, and you can see there's dozens of them. Right. Sure. Lots mm -hmm. of them remote. Codes. Just like we have lots of vulnerabilities on Windows. They definitely do exist on iPhone as well. Now, a number of these are browser-based Safari, so mm -hmm. it's not just unique to the iPhone's OS, but some of right. these things might extend it to the Mac OS. But then again, the, the big picture is that we've seen 500 and some mobile phone Trojans and viruses all together, and not a single one of them yet through an exploit. Every single one so far requires user interaction, so you will install it yourself, or you get a Bluetooth beam, or you get an SMS. So, of course, these drive-by downloads are perfectly doable and possible, but it has yet to happen. Hmm. So what about Android? Android, there was some fishy stuff in the App Store right. that was marketplace. using, right, yeah. marketplace, um, that was using banks' intellectual properties, how right. they got it pulled out, but mm -hmm. people were actually installing this. Yes, yes, this was the 09 Droid case. Not exactly sure. Uh, the Android platform doesn't allow for shortcuts going directly to a website, mm -hmm. so pretty much it acted as a bookmark on the Android's uh, desktop, and you clicked on that, and you went to your banking website, and mm -hmm. there wasn't anything going on underneath the scenes, so, so but who knew? Right. The, the fact that you know you, it would allow you to access your online bank, and it didn't do anything bad, but it could have, is bad enough. And of course, these were then pulled by Google from the marketplace. And this is the big difference between Apple App Store and, and uh, the Google Marketplace. You can't get stuff to App Store un unless it goes through Apple and Apple checks it out and approves it and then posts it. Mm. And it's pretty much the other way around on, on the Android Marketplace. I mean, everything gets posted and then if there's complaints, then they're basically pulled. Yeah. That's pretty much the gist of it. And, and that's, of course, a huge difference. So mm. we do expect to see more activity on the iPhones and, and on the Android side as well. So I expect the community to be a bit more lively there in policing what's, what's out there. That's likely. Uh, so likely. I think that's the um, double-edged sword of it. I mean, Google wants innovation, mm -hmm. so the platform is open, right. more more open for that type of development. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to take some risks along with the games. There you go. And as the last topic, what about Palm? Palm, WebOS. Um, it's kind of a browser-based operating system. Mm -hmm. So some researchers found flaws. Uh, in the SMS handling, I believe, right. that allowed HTML code to be injected, and, and because it's a web browser-based operating system, it did whatever the HTML sure. told it to, and they found several different things, uh, tricks that they could play with this type of attack. Right. Most of it malicious, nothing that would make a profit for somebody. Right. Um, so we probably, you know, as most malware today is profit-driven, wouldn't see anything like that implemented, but it was a good example of uh, here's some HTML flaws, and we've seen these types of flaws in PCs on browsers a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the researcher's point of view was that got to get these things out to market, and we know these types of flaws are a problem. We know that they have existed in other platforms, mm -hmm. but yet here they come again. Right. And it is surprising that you can really exploit these mobile devices through a text message. I mean, it, it shouldn't be possible. You know, it's just text message, and yet. We've seen this case last summer. We saw the Black Hat demo of exploiting code as unsandboxed root on mm -hmm. an iPhone device by uh, Miller and Mulliner. So these things do happen. And that's pretty much the mobile case so far. Thank you very much.